Bring near the earth to touch their hearts of gold. I don't know if the people in the booth knew that we actually started our service. They might think we're doing the sing-along. Can you make sure that we need lyrics now? All right, let's sing that again. It came upon a midnight clear that glorious song of old from angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold peace on the earth good will to men from heaven's all gracious king the world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing glory to God in the highest glory to God evermore good news great joy for all in the highest. One thing that we've been doing um, is lighting the wreaths of the Advent candle. That was backwards. We've been lighting the candles of the Advent wreath. So I'm going to ask the Bright family to come up. Um, one of them is going to be hobbling up, so you can find out his story later. But we're so happy they're here, and we're so happy they're going to read us what belongs in this second week of Advent. It's a tradition that churches had for many years, and each candle represents something different. 
And it's the idea that with Christ's birth, the light shone in the darkness and, and brought us hope and peace and love and joy. So each candle represents something different. And we'll let the brights tell you what we're celebrating today. candle of peace and read from Matthew 1 20 to 21. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Step down from heaven, humbly you came, God of all creation, here with us, in a starlit manger, Emmanuel, light to offer to heaven. 
heaven's king I will bring my life my love my all adore come let us adore oh come let us adore him the Lord worship Christ the Lord let all that sing praises ring to the newborn king peace on earth here with us joy awakening at your feet we fall angels sing praises ring to the newborn king peace on earth here with us joy awakening at your feet we fall angels sing praises ring to the newborn king peace on earth here with us joy awakening at your feet we fall angels sing praises ring to the newborn king peace on earth here with us joy awakening at your feet we fall adore come let us adore oh come let us adore take a minute and bow your heads and in the midst of this busy season maybe even the midst of your busy day today would you offer a prayer of adoration today adoration is just telling God what we know to be true of him invite Christine up. As we've been going through the Bible, we've been learning about all kinds of prophets and kings and what they contributed or didn't contribute. So I'm curious, what will the king today bring? What story will he bring? So let's have Christine tell us about that. Thank you, Miss Suzanne. Good morning, neighborhood kids and everyone else. I'm so glad you're here today for another story from God's Word, the Bible, which we know is absolutely true and completely trustworthy. And it teaches us how to li love the one true God of heaven, the capital G God we call him. And we want to please him because we love him. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles right now to 2 Kings 21. Last week, we met the good king Hezekiah. He ruled the southern kingdom of Judah and was one of the good kings that they had. He loved God, he followed God, and he showed us how to be successful in life by following God with all of our heart. One of the things that he had done was he got rid of all of the idols, all of the little G gods, and he told the people that they needed to worship the one true God, the capital G God. And we know that when King Hezekiah sinned, when he did things that did not please God, one of the things that he did 
was to repent, and he asked God to forgive him. And we know that God forgave him just as he forgives us when we repent. Well, when Hezekiah died, his son Manasseh became king. Now, Manasseh was only 12 years old when he became king. And one of the things that he did was he brought back and rebuilt all of those altars his, his father had torn down. And even in the temple, he put altars to other gods, not the one true God. And he caused all these people to worship these false gods once again. The Bible says of him that he did more evil than even the Amorites. The Amorites were the people who lived in Canaan before Joshua led the people in and got rid of them. There was no worse thing you could say than to say he was worse than the Amorites. And God said, there will be a consequence for this. When Manasseh heard this, Manasseh did a good thing. He repented, and he took the gods out of the temple and tried to focus the people on worshiping the capital G God once again. Well, when he died, his son took over. His son's name was Ammon. And the Bible says of Ammon that he did all the evil that his father did. And something that might you might even say is worse is he did not repent. He was not sorry for leading the people astray. And he reigned for only two years. That might have been a good thing. When he died, his very young son, Josiah, took the throne. Josiah was only eight years old when he became king. But he did right in God's eyes. He was actually the last of the godly kings in Judah. One of his first jobs was to repair the temple. And so he collected gold and silver and jewelry and such from all the people throughout Judah so that they could fix up the temple once again. And then he gave that money to the carpenters, to the builders, to the stonemasons, and they were trustworthy and bought the supplies they needed and made that temple beautiful once again. Well, while they were working on the temple, they came across a book of the law, and they brought it to Josiah. Now, that book of the law was probably the first five books of our Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And it was on a scroll, and it had probably been hidden somewhere in a wall inside the temple to keep it safe. And the Bible tells us that when Josiah heard the words of the Bible, he tore his robes. That is a sign of great distress, of being very, very sorry for your sin. Because Josiah realized that the people had been sinning terribly. They had forsaken God. And so he called for a prophet. And at that time, there was a prophetess, a woman. And her name was Hulda. And she came and she told Josiah, you are absolutely right. God is going to punish you all for all of this wickedness, for forsaking the one true God. But... Because you had a humble response, you tore your robes, you showed that you wanted to repent and be forgiven, God will forgive you and God will keep the judgment until after you die. You won't have to see it. Well, Josiah called all the people together and they crowded in so that they could be there with him and he had that same scroll, the book of the law, read to all of the people. And the people decided that day that they would renew their covenant with God, that they would choose to be God's chosen people and follow him alone and not all the little g-gods that were around. They started destroying all of the idols. They got rid of these little g-gods. They had cleaned up the temple. And it says in the Bible that they went throughout the whole land of Judah. Not just the temple, not just Jerusalem, the whole province. 
and got rid of all of the idols because they wanted to worship God and to serve him with their, all of their heart and soul and mind and strength. And then they held Passover. Passover had not been celebrated in many years, and the Bible says that this was a Passover unlike any before. So many animals were slain so that people could be forgiven of their sin, and they rejoiced and made this commitment to serve God. You know, King Josiah read God's word, and he repented of his sin. He helped the whole nation of Judah come back to worship the one true God. What is your response when you read God's word? Does it cause you to repent of your sin, those wrong things that you have thought and done and said all week? Does it make you want to love God more and follow him? Because those are the right responses of a devoted fan of God, someone who loves the Lord with all of their heart and soul and mind and strength. Kids, you will learn more about this in Sunday school right now. You are dismissed out the door. And adults, we invite you to stand and greet one another. Oh, sorry, video. Did I miss that?
All right, kids, you can be dismissed. Aren't you excited to find out what happens next? All right. So this, uh, as we all know, Christmas is coming, and there's no stopping it. And uh, <laughs> we have some special Christmas uh, services coming, a New Year service too. And uh, as you well know, Christmas and New Year's are on Sunday, um, on Monday this year, so it gives uh, us an opportunity to worship on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, which is kind of nice. So we're joining forces with the Baptists as well as the Thai Missions Church for a Christmas Eve morning service and a New Year's Eve morning service. But don't come at 9.15, they're gonna be at 10 o'clock. If you come at 9.15, you can rehearse with the band and sing Christmas carols and that would be great, like we did today. And then for Christmas Eve, we'll be meeting at 10 p.m for our candlelight service. And if you, did I say six? He got it right, it says six, I probably said 10. I'm not quite awake yet this morning. 6 p.m. for the candlelight service over at the Cypress campus. Six o'clock here, four o'clock at Cypress. I'm doing a bang up job, all right. I should stick to drums. 6 p.m., or I'll just read the script, how about that? 6 p.m. here for the candlelight service, and if you can't make that, Cypress Campus at 4 p.m. The holiday season can be quite busy, but we sure hope that you make time for God in that uh, schedule of yours. We have an Advent devotional available out front uh, for those to help with that. And if you start today, you still have time to finish by Christmas. Uh, we're hoping for a $5 uh, donation to help offset the cost, but if not, just grab one anyway. Uh, so please take one. Uh, pay now or later or not at all. Uh, just take one and enjoy this uh, Advent time with, uh, with Jesus this season. And also important is our staff. They've been working all year uh, for us, for uh, the message that uh, we bring every, uh, every Sunday, for all the programs that go on behind the scenes and out in front uh, for the outreach uh, that we have. And we just want to take this time every, uh, every December to pick or to uh, collect an offering for our staff and present it to them before Christmas as an appreciation. And so uh, I'd invite you all to uh, contribute to, to a staff gift and just uh, be a way to say thank you and that we love and appreciate our staff. And it's the paid staff as well as the volunteer staff that uh, benefit from that, our pastors and, and uh, everyone else also. And as always, uh, in the black box in the back, you can put your offerings and also the prayer cards uh, if you want prayer for anything, or if you just want to say hi to Justin. And with that, we'll uh, get back to our worship. Would you stand with us? There's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful... Well, I guess we all have our own opinions of Christmas carols, but this one is haunting because it captures in the music how the people were feeling. There was 400 years between... just It felt like God was silent. Of course he wasn't because God never is, and he was still giving people life and breath and gifts each day, but they had been waiting, they had been dreaming, they wanted deliverance. And Jesus was fulfillment of that. So as we prepare our hearts to learn from God's Word today, Justin will be taking us to Isaiah, which is a prophet in the Bible, before Jesus came. But we want to put our hearts in that position too. What are your longings? What are those deep desires in your heart that only a powerful God could meet in person and change for you? Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive is 
Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee. Come thou day spring, come and cheer Our spirits by thine adventeer Disperse the gloomy clouds of night And death's dark shadows put to flight Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, desire of nations, bind in one the hearts of all mankind. Bid thou our sad division cease. Fill the whole world with heaven's peace. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Sing rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. You may have a seat. Thank you guys for leading us in worship. Merry Christmas. It's good to be with you. Um, I want to start with some participation here. Um, who's your favorite, and when I put favorite in quotes, Christmas villain of a Christmas story? Like, um, I mean, for me, it would be like technology. Like, I think it's worse than an Amorite, honestly. But um, what about for you? What are, go ahead and shout them out. Who are your favorite, uh, your most villainous Christmas villains? Any? The Grinch? I hear the Grinch. He's, he's a foul one. Yeah, any others? Scrooge, Scrooge, what? Jack Frost. Jack Frost. Oh, Jack Frost. Okay. Any others? Good. The good ones. The Wet Bandits are a great one. Um, yeah, I got Scrooge and Grinch on my list. Mr. Potter, if you like the classics. Um, great stories have great villains, and Christmas is no exception. Now, if you're taking bets in your pews, first shame on you. You shouldn't be gambling in church. But next... If you think this sermon's about Herod, that's not actually what we're talking about today. But as I was writing this earlier this week, Cale had a soccer tournament, so I was working in Arizona where he was playing this week. And so, um, and so lots of Christmas movies were on in, in, in our room in the evening. And, and I was writing this sermon, and I thought, man, Christmas villains are kind of fun because they're always a little bit goofy, right? And, and they're, yeah, they're just something fun about them, even though they're the bad guys, but the, I, I wished kind of for the silliness of Christmas villains in comparison to the real world villains that we have to deal with, right? Like from the different, and, and not necessarily people, but situations. For example, like it might be misunderstandings or frustration with our family. Now your family is not villains. I'm talking about the actual misunderstanding that is the villainous thing, um, that's on one end, the strife that we have to deal with that's very serious to us, to actual hot wars in Israel and Ukraine. And so for a moment, I'm thinking Christmas is so fun. Christmas is so joyous. Why can't we have some of these light type of wet bandits kind of villains or adversity to talk about? But instead, we live in some pretty heavy times. And as I kept pondering Christmas and, and in the preparation for this message, I realized Christmas, the backdrop at least to the Christmas story is pretty dark. 
It was heavy times for them. Christmas itself is not dark. It was the light that was piercing the darkness, but the darkness it pierced was very, very heavy. And so we're in Isaiah 9 this morning. You can turn there if you like. It'll also be on the screens. And as you are, um, one of the things that's important to know is there's significant overlap from last week's message to this week's message in some sense. Um, so we're not going to repeat a lot of that, but I'll summarize some things that, and we'll expand on some things we didn't hit as much last week. Um, so we're, we're going to cover some new ground as well as some stuff where you're saying, didn't we talk about that last week? Well, yeah, the world's still dark this week, just like last week. So um, the context is similar. Uh, it's dark again. This is more focused, what we're looking at today, on Judah, the bottom part, the, the, the bottom part of Miss Christine's geographical ice cream cone right there, right? And so it's about to be destroyed by the Babylonians. They're, they're coming. And as we think about war and tension, um, war in the world and tension in our country, the Bible's no stranger to real world pain. It speaks to it. It's born in it. That's the situation from which Isaiah is writing. Very real pain. Very impending doom. And so our title today, is, as we work through this series, is What the Gift Will Be. Like we're wondering on those videos, what will the gift be? Well, today we're looking at what Isaiah says the Messiah will be like, what Jesus will be like. Now, last week we covered why we need the gift. The reason we need the gift is despair, darkness, sin, the fruits of sin, and everything that comes with, us, with it. But beyond that, now we're looking and seeing that the one who is promised is greater than all of this. And we're He's, we're told this centuries before his arrival. God told Israel the hope would come, that light would illuminate their darkness. So forget the villains. A hero is coming unlike any other, and he is bringing the light. He is the light. And so for us, as we ponder our darkness, our sadness, our pain, our suffering, we might wonder, is God really enough to speak to this moment? And today's passage is going to show us how wonderful he is and how he measures up against the challenge. So let's pick up Isaiah's message in chapter 9. And the first thing we're going to see is that God isn't scared of the dark. Would you pray with me? Um, go ahead and stand if you're able and pray with me, and then we'll get into our text this morning. Father, thank you for your amazing goodness to us, a chance to come together and worship you and just uh, be in your presence, which we can be all the time, but to do it together, there's something special about that. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be magnified in this time of preaching as you have been so far in, in Miss Christine teaching us and, and in worship as well. And so we pray your blessing upon this time. Open our eyes to hear what it is you want, to st want us to see and our ears to hear what you want us to hear. And Lord, give us the courage to do what you've called us to do in light of that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So God isn't scared of the dark, and make no mistake, the context here is darkness. Chapter 8, verse 22 says, And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. So it is dark, it's grim, but God is greater than the darkness. That's not the end of the story. So we look at the beginning of chapter 9, but there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. So it's grim, it's bad. But the story isn't over. And so we keep reading, and it says, In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. So there's a ton here, but I don't want to get too ahead of myself, so let's start with what this geography is all about. It's up north, near the top of the ice cream cone there, and it's where the Assyrian conquest started some 150 years before the Babylonians came in to take care of the southern kingdom. Now, it's easy to think of Jerusalem as the crown jewel, that a nation has only truly fallen when the capital falls, and that may be true in part, but here's a reminder that God doesn't forget the little people on the outskirts where the darkness first came and started to move south and start taking over the northern kingdom. These are the people who had been bearing the burden from the beginning. It has been darkest here longest, but God promises them hope. He's not just worried about the kings and their corridors of power, but the burden will be lifted first where it was laid upon them by the Assyrians. It's a beautiful picture of God running towards the darkness. Pretty cool. And it gets cooler because you notice what he called it? What he called Galilee? He called it Galilee of the nations. 
Now, there's no Messiah talk quite yet in chapter 9, but it starts in chapter 7. And spoiler alert, the Messiah of Israel, he's going to be a blessing, a savior to the whole world. There's hope for Israel here, but there's hope for everyone here. See, God's not scared of the dark. He's not scared of your dark. He's not scared of mine. He isn't the author of evil, but he uses it all the time for his good purposes. It's where he does his deepest work of transformation. And he does amazing work in us, and, and darkness and defeat and fear is never the end of the story unless we decide to give up on the story, but it's never the end of the story with God. So bring him your mess. See what he can do with it. He spoke hope into the most desperate times of the people of Israel. And the pain still came. Conquest still came, but it was despair on a national level. And he says there's still hope coming. And, and, and he can speak hope into our personal darkness. If he can do it with a nation, he can do it with each one of us. But it isn't just hope. As we keep reading, we see point number two is that God brings victory. I'll, I'll read the text. And as I do, some of it might sound strange, but the gist of it is pretty clear that these places of darkness and defeat will give way to victory. Look at verses 3 to 5. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Told you it was a little bit weird, but, but here's the gist of it. There's going to be joy and there's going to be harvest instead of war, instead of oppression. Note specifically it mentions a yoke there. A yoke is, has nothing to do with an egg. Well, it does, but not this kind of yoke. It's the kind of thing that you would put on an ox or, or a creature of burden so that it could pull a plow or something like that. And sometimes it was put on people, and so it had a very literal or metaphorical connection also with slavery, usually because someone was a prisoner of war. It's a pretty ugly concept. But here it says it's going to be broken. That there's no more need, the, the, the yoke will be broken of oppression from, from their enemies, and there's no more need for battle garments. You can roll them up and burn them because a time of peace is coming. Good times are ahead on the other side of your pain. So that begs the question, how is this going to happen? And so now we get to the Messiah, the promise of the one to come who's going to make things right. Verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. A child is born. That doesn't sound terribly intimidating, but it's what God has chosen. And so we finally see that God wins through Messiah. The one to come is going to be the one who sets things right. God wins through Messiah. That's your third point if you're keeping score on your worship folder. And if you're getting really excited, like, wow, he got there really fast on point three. We are going to be out of here so early. No, we're, spending, so we're camping here on point three a bit, so settle in, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to see what kind of Messiah um, this will be. And once we see him as we should, once we see him more clearly, a lot of things in our world that are, feel out of whack can find their proper place. And so we're going to spend most of our time here because this can absolutely change everything if we actually rightly order our world around who Messiah is as opposed to Messiah expecting him to kind of conform around our world and our priorities. So... Um, and, as I, and I, I, I pray, I hope, that as we see him more clearly, that we'll start to wonder why we keep looking at these other G gods for satisfaction and meaning in our lives. So, let's hear about the Messiah all at once, then we'll take it piece by piece. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So it starts with the government being upon his shoulder. What does that mean? Well, 
if, if you've been frustrated with government over the last several years, decade, decades, half a century, I don't know, but we know the frustration at some point, um, depending on your persuasion, you've been frustrated. Um, and I don't say that with any partisanship because no one's been happy for quite a while, right? And what we think is we think that if everyone just did things like I think they should be done, we'd be good. But let me, I promise you that's not the case because people are people and we're sinners and we have a way of messing up everything. And, and this isn't a, just a modern phenomenon, by the way. Messiah will have the government upon his shoulders. But one of the things that's interesting, at least one of the scholars that I read said, notice in this passage, there's a lot of regal names, but no one calls him king because their kings stunk. Except for Josiah, it was a pretty bad run during this time. And so they chose not to use the word kings because the kings from Jerusalem failed them, which is why one had to come, like we talked about last week, from the city of David, and that would be Messiah. But when Messiah reigns, when the government's upon his capable shoulder, everything will be different. Righteousness will reign. The poor and vulnerable will be cared for. War will one day cease. This is what Messiah will bring. And we think we know what we want in our politically charged world, what we need for things to be perfect. And maybe we have a better idea than some people, but it's really Messiah that's going to make it all happen. Things won't be perfect until Messiah reigns. And so we pray, come Lord Jesus and reign forever. I got to stop because there's more here. So we're going to keep going. Next thing is he's a wonderful counselor. And now a couple chapters earlier in Isaiah, Messiah is said to be Emmanuel, God with us. He is with us as a counselor. But when we say counselor, don't think therapist, and I don't say that as a bad thing, that has its place, but think rather consultant or advisor or presidential cabinet kind of thing here. He dispenses wisdom without end. You ever wondered what to do, how to think, how to navigate our crazy world? Wouldn't it be great to have a guide for such a time as these? What would I say if you, you have it? couple, actually. I mean, first off, if, if, you, if you call yourself a Jesus follower, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, then you have the Holy Spirit living in you, right? And the Holy Spirit, one of the things he does is guides. Now, we, that is something the Holy Spirit is perfect, but sometimes it takes us a while to dial into what he's saying, and there can be some subjectivity in that. Um, but it's also not the only way God counsels. Um, 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, or woman, equipped for every good work. See, the counselor has spoken, and this is everything we need to do what God has called us to do, to navigate the craziness of the world we live in. And you say, but a lot of stuff that's happening, it's just not in the Bible, it doesn't speak to you. And and that's true in some cases. At one level, it may not be spoken to specifically, but if we can have a mind and a heart and be shaped as people by the word and have that foundation in place and have those rails in place, it can help us navigate wisely through what is uncharted territories in some sense, but God knows what he's doing. He's always known what he's doing, and he has laid down the way for us to move forward so we can navigate faithfully. It doesn't happen overnight. You may not always find chapter and verse. But if you have a mind and a heart and a life transformed by the scriptures, you're going to know how to navigate it faithfully. Foolish kings from Jerusalem, they reject counsel. But we have a counselor who can help us us overcome the wiles of the shrewdest of villains if we'll listen. After wonderful counselor, the next thing we see is this child will be mighty God. How's that for a mic drop? I mean, that's, that's, that's big, right? There's no, no way around how staggering and bold this is. A child will become God Almighty. For some people, this would be crazy talk, but it will be true. One scholar says this about the mighty God. He didn't have any qualms using the word king, which Messiah is king and more. He says the king will have God's true might about him. Power so great that it can absorb all the evil which can be hurled at it until none is left to hurl. That's what Jesus did at the cross. That's why his divinity is so critical to our salvation that he did for us and every one of us who will receive it what we couldn't do for ourselves. That he took our sin upon himself and the punishment for that so that we could live freely and only God can bear that weight. 
as the mighty God, he runs to the darkness and he shines his light there and there is nothing, absolutely nothing he can't overcome. No villain, no situation, no whatever is beyond his reach or his power. But we've got to bring it to him. That's our responsibility is to quit holding on to it ourselves and say, God, I need, I need your help with this. Next one, everlasting father. This is not to say the son is the father, but that the Messiah will be everlasting and he will reflect the fatherhood of God. Israel's king's pretty hit and miss. Josiah was a hit. Lots of misses in and around him. Um, mostly misses during Isaiah's time. Their leadership was nothing like a good father's leadership. They were a mess, but the one to come would lead with love and care and authority like a good father. And he would do it eternally. No more this one step forward, two or three steps back with the judges and the kings and the foolish leadership of the time. The everlasting father who loves and shepherds will arrive as an infant, as a son. How beautiful is that? One more, and it's pretty loaded here. Prince of Peace. So good, so rich here. What do we mean by Prince of Peace? Well, on one level, and really, what do we mean by peace? On the most basic level, peace is just a lack of war or violence, right? And we take that in a lot of places around the world, and even if it's just personal conflict within our home. This kind of peace, we could get behind, and I'd settle for it, honestly. Um, it's great. But that's the lowest level of peace. We can't even hit the lowest level, which is saying something, right? But that's not all that can be meant by peace. Because the next level of peace might be some well-being, some wholeness, a sense that all is good, right? The first level of peace secures human life. The next level of peace is experiencing human flourishing. It's in part an inner peace, a knowledge, and a resting in what's good, it's subjective, but this prince will bring peace to all who order this, themselves under his reign. And then there's the highest level of peace, and this is um, probably the key to all the other levels, to be honest. So maybe I should have switched the levels, but it's too late now. Um, but this highest level of peace is the peacemaker, the reconciler, who makes peace possible, not just among us, but specifically with God, that makes everything else possible. Isaiah 53, 5, another image of Messiah not related to the infant says he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed this child centuries down the line is going to be amazing no wonder so much hope was invested in Messiah because he's going to change everything and then our passage ends with this fact that Messiah will be in the Davidic line and a recap that his reign is going to be amazing and executed by the very power of God. Verse 7 is, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And so ends our passage. And let me let you in on a terribly kept secret. Lean in here a little bit. Jesus is this Messiah. I know. I know. You heard it here first, right? This is Jesus that Isaiah is talking about. We talked about fulfilled prophecy last week. Um, you can look that up if you, if you missed it. But amazing stuff to see that only Jesus fits the fingerprint of Messiah. But I want to look for a second and just... See how this, the, the, the messianic role, how it's been established in this passage, how it's fulfilled by Jesus in his ministry. And then a little bit of what that means for us. First, remember that God's not afraid of the dark, right? He actually sent Jesus to be the light of the world. And when Jesus starts his ministry, listen to this from Matthew chapter 4. So that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death on them, a light has dawned. Does that sound familiar? Nod yes, or I'll know you were sleeping earlier, right? He's quoting Isaiah. Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, has come for Jew and Gentile alike, just like Isaiah said he would. 
Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, started his work in an area known for their Gentile population, way up north. He was indiscriminate in his love. And that isn't just interesting, that's transformative. Because if he came for Jew and Gentile alike, no matter who you are, that includes you. That includes me. You matter to him. Your problems, your pain, your darkness, your frustration, it matters to him. And not only that, remember our second point. Next, we saw that God gives the victory. He has a better way for us than us taking up our burdens on our own. He's not just going to break the, the yoke. He's going to break the yoke of the enemies. He's going to break the yoke of external enemies. But sometimes we can be our own worst enemy. Right? And he can break the yokes that we put upon ourselves. Not only that, he doesn't just break yokes. He actually has a better yoke for us. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What an amazing passage. His yoke is easy. Now, some of you who pay really good attention and, and remember a couple months ago, you're like, whoa, 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 I'm not buying it. Because I remember that sermon when we were going through the kind of the highlights of Luke, and you talked about how we have to take up our cross daily and follow him. We have to count the cost of following him. We have to surrender our lives to him and give ourselves fully to Jesus, and we do. Doesn't sound like an easy yoke to me. Sounds pretty sacrificial. And, and it's true. We need to count the cost of what it means to follow Jesus. We need to count the cost of discipleship. But one of the things we never do is we never count the cost of non-discipleship. We never count the cost of what it means to not follow Jesus. See, when we take our yoke on upon ourselves instead of Jesus's, we have to find our purpose on our own. We have to discover our value on our own. We have to find the power to live on our own, and we can do that, but some of that is just residual from uh, the, 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 the groundwork that, that Christianity has laid through time, and some of it's just making it up ourselves. But when we take Jesus' yoke upon us, the most important answers to life's questions are answered. Our purpose is to glorify him and to to serve others in Jesus' name. When Jesus' yoke is upon us, we understand that we are valued by God simply by the fact that we have been conceived and known from before the beginning of time. When we take Jesus' yoke upon us, we know that, that then the Holy Spirit lives within us and we are empowered to do what he's called us to do and live how he's called us to live, the cost of not following Jesus is far greater than the cost of following him. And then finally, we saw that God wins through Messiah. And among all of those things we saw about Messiah, he brings peace is where we ended up. Foundationally, he made peace between us and God. Go to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to uh, bring a little Christmas into that, you can go with our benediction for this week. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Jesus is the hero of the Christmas story. He wants to be the hero of our story too. And I hope you'll let him. He does for us what we can't do for ourselves. Peace with God comes when we entrust our lives to him, and it'll make your Christmas more meaningful meaningful than ever. If you've not done that, one of the ways you do that is that you admit that you're a sinner. And if that seems harsh, don't worry. It's true of everyone. The idea is that we live for ourselves instead of God, and we were made to live for him. That we are sitting on the throne of our lives when Jesus was meant to sit on that throne of our lives. And so we recognize that reality say, okay, God, I want to give you control. And I believe that you died on the cross to pay for my sins and give me new life. And you don't just believe that in your head because the demons know that's true. But then you say, I want to entrust myself to you. You commit to him. Admit, believe, commit. Say, God, I give my life to you. I want to follow you. And so if you want to know how to do that, I would love to talk with you. I'd love to pray with you after service. Um, I'll be out the doors and to the left. But also if you're like, hmm. I'm not ready to talk to the pastor yet, but I want to wrestle with some of these things. This, I find this something worth thinking about. We have these things called next step packs. You don't have to sign off or anything. There's a couple of them out there. I'll put this one out there as well. Grab one of these, and there's some stuff that if you're 
thinking through things intellectually, there's some resources in there for you for that. And if you are wrestling with what God's doing in your heart, so there's some things that might help with that as well. So I encourage you to grab one of those as you leave if that's what, um, where God's working on you this morning. We also want to spend time with him this Christmas. So the gift, the devotional, it's the same as the sign out there uh, behind me. Um, grab one of those outside. And if you finish one, if you start today, you'll finish by Christmas if you hit every day. So I encourage you to grab one of those. And I would love to pray with you outside if you need prayer about anything at all, but specifically about, specifically about what we've talked about this morning. I would love to pray with you. And so my prayer is that, that we end our time here today just amazed by Jesus. That the villains of materialism, family strife, and remember, it's strife that's a villain, not your family. Um, Trauma, war, whatever it is, that we would, for a time, let that give way to being amazed, standing in awe of how great Jesus is, and um, letting things order themselves under that reality. My prayer isn't that we would forget the hardships, but that we would situate them under the lordship of Jesus so that they're put in the right perspective and we would dwell and learn to live in God's great love for us. And and I don't think anything helps us do that better than celebrating the Lord's Supper. That is a tangible reminder that he has given us of his great love for us, his stepping into history, into reality, and being crucified for us to bear God's wrath against sin in our place so that we might live eternally with him and enjoy a relationship with him today. So if you you didn't get your communion elements when you came in, um, raise your hand, and Alan has them here. He will bring them to you, um, and we will take them in just a couple minutes. And I encourage you to take this time. Maybe you need to trust Jesus for the first time, and if that's where you are, then this is a great time to say, God, I, I admit I'm a sinner. I don't know how all this works, but I believe that Jesus died for me, and I want to be part of his family. I'm giving my life to him. Pray that. And we'll talk about it more, but take these elements and celebrate that new life. Uh, maybe you're a believer and you're like, man, I've been just doing my own thing and I'm, I'm in a bad place and I'm not even sure I'm worthy of this. All that makes you worthy of this is repenting. Just saying, God, I don't got it all together, but I know this is the answer. And if that's where you are, then this is a great time to take that. And if things are good, like I say regularly, you don't have to make bad things up. Just thank Jesus that things are good right now and, and thank him for that gift. And we'll... we'll Take a couple minutes to reflect, and then we'll all come back and take the elements together.
gospel this morning. And as they were eating, Jesus took a bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Let's eat together. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you. For this cup, is, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's drink together. Father, we thank you for the gift of life that you've given us in Jesus. And in that hope in our sadness and our hard times, But even beyond that, Lord, um, an assurance that you will not just give us hope down the line, but that it's sure to happen. That it's not wishful thinking, but it's grounded in the very character of who you are and what you've done for our good and for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we conclude today, let's sing the whole story and think, where do you fit in this story that God is weaving for all mankind? In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the father praise the son praise the spirit to the King of Kings. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation. Jesus, for our sake, you died. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. morning that you rose all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name and in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me. Let's sing praise the Father. Praise the Father. Spirit, three and one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. Praise the Father, praise the Son, 
That is our prayer. I'm going to ask you to stand up as we take the benediction today. Um, it comes from Luke 2. If you read all of Luke, you'd find out the details of Jesus' birth. But it says this, and this is what the angels sang. Glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace on those on whom his favor rests. So may you go in the peace and love of Christ today. Have a wonderful Sunday and a wonderful week. We'll see you next week for week three of Advent.